created throughout the history and as we begin to read the chapter we have a, a story of um, Saint Elizabeth Seton and her search for God how she was discovering throughout her life that something was missing and that this um, part of her heart was not filled with the love of God and what is this the universal desire for God that is in our souls and in our hearts how do we know what to look for and how do we know when to begin and what is the fundamental question every creature every human being asks of itself and as we read through the chapter we see that the fundamental question is who am I and why am I here and before we actually start our search we cannot answer these questions um, because all these questions pertain to God's existence now when I was reading this chapter I thought about why is it so difficult for us human beings to actually answer those questions about human existence and I was thinking about um, the book of Genesis when we look at um, Adam and Eve, how they were created, the fullness of grace with all of the gifts that we don't possess. Uh, they were called the uh, preternatural gifts and supernatural gifts of grace. And these gifts were lost for all of us because of them. Yes, our first parents, Adam and Eve, that's the beginning. This is when God created human beings created them in a perfect way, created them good and because of pride and pride is the beginning of all sin because of pride they lost their gifts and something about pride that may, you may want to remember I, I read it somewhere in a book called Virtues and Vices by Denis de Cartusian it's a very dense reading, I did not understand half of it but what I understood was he said that every sin runs away from God but pride will stand up to him and I guess that's the essence of pride that's what it does yes it stands up to God himself so that's what happened to them and the one of the consequences of their sin is that our mind our intelligence is is kind of blurry and all of the gifts that they had and they lost we will be given later in the future life and the gifts that we lost is uh, sanctifying grace the grace and fullness and one of the consequences of of uh, of their sin is original sin and this is lack of sanctifying grace and righteousness in human being as we know that introduces evil to the world because human beings were not righteous anymore they're open for temptation and for sin and actually their nature became corrupted not completely destroyed as goodness but corrupted by sin the first sin and that's what we inherit and then the second consequence was ignorance which results in lack of knowledge also so our mind our intellect was weakened that's one of the consequences the third according to Saint Thomas Aquinas and I'm sure you know him well is concupiscence, concupiscence. so our passions no longer are integrated under reason and will and concupiscence is what causes you know the um,
I forgot the word. Mm. This disorientation of our passions that we don't have our passions under control of our will and our intellect. And there is a way to bring our passions to elevate our intellect and our will to the level where we can control our passions, but that comes with spiritual life and relationship with God. But we'll be talking about it later. That's when we develop the relationship with God, we can actually acquire the strength again. It's a gift from God through the relationship with Him. We can control our passions in a better way. We can be more controlling. And that's a strength that we strive for. That's one of the benefits of having a relationship with the Lord. That our passions can be brought back under control of our will. And the fourth consequence was mortality and sickness. And this is probably what we as human beings see the most and we can recognize it yes because we all have to die and we all suffer some people suffer physically less others more and also this is part of our faith that suffering you know brings people closer to God when we embrace it because of of the cross of Christ So, our quest for God is weakened because of the loss of the preternatural gifts. And that would be the first thing I wanted to emphasize. But, of course, we have to follow what the saints are saying and, and, the, and the doctors of the church about, um, about the quest for God. But, first of all, I think it would be good in this moment uh, of our of our study to actually to actually wonder about the existence of God okay because how do we know that God exists and that I actually should be longing for him and before even the revelation because as we know the philosophers in Greece um, they started thinking about the purpose of their existence much earlier before the gospel was ever proclaimed and I wanted to I wanted to actually go into one of the uh, doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, and based on his examples and his proofs on the existence of God, touch upon the mystery of motion, of um, the motion, the efficient cause of the existence of God, the necessity he gives five ways, five reasons for existence of God. And if you really look at them with open mind, they really make sense. And as you all know, he was one of the greatest theologians, is one of the greatest theologians, and a bunch of our theology and most of our priests and seminarians study theology according to, to the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas. And I can tell you only that, that... Um, Comparing to St. Denis the Cartesian, St. Thomas Aquinas is even more dense. And four years ago when I came to this country and I was reading one of his works for my class, I read one page four times and I called my friends and I asked them to come and explain what he was actually saying because I still didn't know. So if I understand it right now, I think it's, it will be understandable for you. So what is this? that we are really looking for. What is this power of the universe that caused the world, created human beings, is sustaining the whole creation in existence and towards which we are all going? And how do we know that the, that the supreme being actually exists? So the first way, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, is the argument from motion, movement. And he says, that our senses prove that some things are in motion. Yes, it is true. I can be, I can move. This book is in motion when I push it. Yes, I am the one who causes the movement of this book. So the second thing he says is, things move when potential motion becomes actual motion. There is a potency here. And this is actual motion, when this book is actually moving. 
And only an actual motion can convert a potential motion into an actual motion. Now let's go back. I mean, you have to understand that. Only an actual motion, something that's in motion, me, I am in motion, can cause the potential motion to be actual motion. Yes, that's what I'm doing. I am actual motion. This is potential motion here. And I am causing the motion of this potential motion. And it becomes actual motion. Do you understand that? Yes. The fourth thing says that nothing can be at once in both actuality and potentiality in the same respect. So if both actual and potential, it is actual in one respect and potential in one order. So that means that they cannot be together simultaneously unless, and that we will go to this at the end, Therefore, according to his theory, nothing can move itself, yes? This book cannot start moving on its own because I am the one who is causing its motion. And then we'll end up with God, of course. At the end of every single way, we'll come to understanding that God is the one who is causing everything. So therefore, each thing in motion is moved by something else. That's pretty simple, yes? This book is in motion because I am moving it. Therefore, sequence of motion cannot extend ad infinitum, meaning to infinity. Because there must be something that caused this motion. It cannot just go back. Because at the end, there must be something that causes the motion. Therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover. And this first mover has to be an ultimate being that has always existed and is the actual motion. And this everyone understands to be God, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Yes? I think this first way we can say that this makes sense. Yes? For now. The second way is argument from efficient cause. We perceive a series of efficient causes of things in the world. And he explains, he says, nothing exists prior to itself. And that's logical, yes? I don't exist prior to my birth. I did not exist. Therefore, nothing is the efficient cause of itself. I did not cause myself. This book did not cause itself. In a previous efficient cause did not exist, if a previous efficient cause did not exist, neither does the thing that results. And that goes, therefore, if the first thing in a series does not exist, Nothing in the series exists, because there must be an efficient cause. Now, the series of efficient causes cannot extend to infinity, into the past. For then, there would be no thing existing now. Okay? If we go back in the past, and nothing caused existence of something that caused our existence, that doesn't make any sense, yes? Because if we go back with nothingness, that means that this nothing get, nothingness would come back here and that would cause nothing to exist, which means it would, nothing would exist, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Therefore, it is necessary to admit a first efficient cause. There must have been something that caused other things to exist. And that's logical also. And to which everyone gives the name of God. The third way, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, is argument from possibility and necessity. We find in nature things that are possible to be and not to be. That means there are some things that are not necessary. 
Yes? This book is not, it doesn't have to exist. And these things can come into being and go out of being. We call them contingent beings. And when I was reading it, I did use the dictionary. Contingent when one of, was one of the words. I don't use it too often. Now I know what it means. So assume that every being is a contingent being. And then for each contingent being that doesn't have to exist, there is a time it did not exist. Therefore, it is impossible for these always to exist. Okay? There is no being other than God that exists always here. Therefore, at that time, there would have been nothing to bring the currently existing contingent beings into existence. Therefore, nothing would be in existence now. So, St. Thomas Aquinas says, and I agree, we have reached an absurd result from assuming that every being is a contingent being. Therefore, not every being is a contingent being. Therefore, some beings exist of its own necessity and does not receive its existence from another being. Okay, we have the created things and the creator. The created things are created by the creator. Who created the creator? So, those things that exist on its own necessity don't come from another being but rather cause other beings and this all men speak of as God according to St. Thomas Aquinas now the next argument the fourth way of proving God's existence is argument from gradation of beings there is a gradation to be found in things some things are better or worse than others. So predications of degree require reference to the uttermost cause. There must be something that is hot, so we can compare with the hottest. The maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus. I guess that's, the, that's how you pronounce it. Yes, G-N-U-S. Genus. Therefore, there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, the goodness, and every other perfection. So we can compare. And this we call God. An argument from design. That's the last one for the existence of God. We see that natural bodies work toward some goal and do not do so by chance. Most natural things lack knowledge. But as an arrow, and that's an example that portrays it perfectly, as an arrow reaches its target because it is directed by an archer, what lacks intelligence achieves goal by being directed by something intelligent and that would be according to us I presume I am an intelligent being moving something that is not intelligent our intelligence comes from God therefore some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end and this being we call God and this agrees with what Saint Augustine said in his confessions that my heart is restless because it is searching for you O God it is directed towards you O God and who directed it you did you are calling your creation to yourself that's what he is doing So I just thought it was important for us to, to realize 
how other people explain the existence of God so we can defend it sometimes if we need to because all of us are here according to the experience of God that has happened in our life yes but it was a sensual or spiritual or intellectual experience but there is also a logical explanation to the existence of a supreme being that caused all things to happen and when we go to our reading we have um, other ways of um, proving God's existence and one of the ways is through creation and the psalm says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament something my one of my teachers used to recite this psalm to us but I never remembered it maybe I should um, no one can question the beauty of the world yes I mean even if I was thinking about it and and a thought occurred to me that I think with the age of modernization when we actually start building things that look less and less natural it is more and more difficult for human beings that are sensual beings and natural beings to actually acknowledge the presence of God but that's just my thought that I was thinking when I was actually reading it because when we look at the buildings they are cold. It is difficult for me to understand that this building is actually designed by God or it's coming from God of God's creation, I think. When we go to the nature, when we go out and we ex decide for ourselves to actually cut ourselves off from the modern world, leave our cell phones and go hiking somewhere where you cannot hear any cars or see any boats or see any um, planes which is difficult these days but just be with nature it is always more probable and possible that you will experience something divine and it is m less probable that you will experience something divine if you lock yourself in a golden palace and just sit there unless it's a church with tabernacle inside where you can actually feel the presence of the Eucharist but that's I think this you know with creation and and the more we build as human beings it may I mean it's just my thought I cannot you know give my life for it but I just wanted to share my thoughts with you the more we build as human beings I guess uh, things that are f made of concrete or glass or something the less possible is for people who don't know God to actually realize that God exists I mean they can because they think well someone has talent and build this thing yes but when you look at a tree you cannot say that because there was a seed that litter and it came up to be a tree or the mountains no one had talent and power to create a mountain no one had talent and power to actually divide the continents that's the nature and who is behind the nature if not God a supreme being that was the cause of the first movement of this earth and one of the arguments when we go into nothingness can actually portray to the big boom theory because it says that if we go back all the way back that means that nothing existed then when what was the thing that exploded and who caused the explosion and you can ask many questions I don't want to go there I am not ready but it's just my thought so the beauty of the world was noticed by those who actually wrote the Psalms they were praising God through the Psalms and a lot of this written there is connected with the nature so many of our saints so many of the blessed so many of very spiritual people would go to the desert would go to the mountains and contemplate and I am no holy and no blessed but trust me sometimes I just feel this natural longing I want to be away from things that were built by human beings and I just want to go to the forest and be by myself listen to the birds how beautiful they sing because we don't have it too often 
because we are locked in the world of technology. Another way, according, is through the human person. And I know you read it, but I read it too. So, I have some other examples, maybe, that you, they were not in the, in the book here. But one of the things that portray to us is moral goodness. It says in the book that moral goodness appeals to us, yes? When I was here last week, I was hearing some of you saying that you are here because you saw someone who was acting in a different way. You saw someone who was acting in an extraordinary way. And this person was changed because of this person's decision to become a Catholic in that example, in that case. That means that the moral conduct and what goes, the consequences of moral conduct, chose these people's actions, changed this, peop this, this person's actions meaning that this person was acting in a different way, in a way that was good, and goodness is appealing to every single creature, every single person. Goodness is appealing, even to those who, through their hardness of heart, don't acknowledge the existence of God. When you go to a grumpy person, visit this person, and treat this person with love, you may leave the room and still think that this person hated you, but after a few weeks of thought, this person's heart can be open for goodness because goodness is contagious. That's what it is. And through human person, through the goodness of human person, through the example of human person, people come to understanding the existence of God, understanding that there is something that caused this person to act in a certain way. And you know that. Otherwise, you would not be here. Don't you want to act in a certain way that it's appealing to God and other people so other people can also be attracted to this God? God who is the Supreme God. That's what it says. But also that you may know yourself because as we are created in the image and likeness of God, the more we look into ourselves and the stronger the relationship is between me and my God, the more I know about myself. And usually I don't like what I know about myself because through the image of God, I realize how many things I am supposed to change in myself. And it's a beautiful experience. It's purgation on earth. So why have so many, why have so many people not, have not found God yet? The book says, um, our textbook gives a few of the reasons, and there are very good reasons, I think. So many people throughout the world, and I don't blame them, it's very difficult to understand suffering and pain. The presence of suffering and pain and injustice throughout the world. And that prevents them from believing that God is all good, all loving and just and powerful and ill-controlled still. Some say maybe he was in control at some point when he created the world, but then when he created first human being, he lost control. Or maybe he just got bored with them and moved to another world and left this world behind and never looks at it anymore. It is a possibility too for some people. Just checking the time because I thought I would be speaking only 10 minutes, but I guess <laughs> I am not even in the um, second page. <laughs> some people, through their pride or intelligence, or intelligence, sometimes intelligence, and those who are here very intelligent can attest to that. I didn't have a problem with that. Some people through intelligence can say no to God because their intelligence will tell them, oh, I'm sorry, there are no proofs. I mean, look at this, look at that, show me a real Catholic. There are no proofs. I am not so stupid to believe that, you know, maybe Jesus was born and, 
and this baby was so cute and the shepherds came and this baby grew with the mother who was virgin and the angel spoke and then he was crucified and died and he resurrected and all these people died come on a nice story well was it the message proclaimed to the simple hearted first did not baby Jesus invite to the barn the shepherds first intelligence can be an obstacle but intelligence is a gift from God is given for a purpose so an intelligent or more intelligent person than the others can use it for the glory of God and in fact every single gift big or small is meant to be used for the glory of God yes people who wipe the floor or their life and do nothing else they can do it for the glory of God and become saints that's the message I don't know if you've heard about Saint Bakita a saint from Africa just recently I watched the movie about her and it just struck me because when I came here I had so many plans I was like oh yes I will do this and that <laughs> come on and then <laughs> And then I watched this movie. I mean, there are many things, but you know, young priests get excited about everything and they want to change the world until God steps on their back and says, just relax. <laughs> Let me do it. You are not the savior and you will never be one. So I watched the movie and Bakita, she was a slave. She couldn't do anything. The only thing that she was good at was being a slave. All her masters said that. She is the best slave I've ever had. In her little things, wiping the floor, getting beaten up by the masters, saying nothing, in her little way of life, she was Christ-like without knowing Christ. She got to know him in her later age, after 30 or something. When she looked at the cross and asked, who is that? Well, guess what? He was a slave, treated as a slave. And then, in her little way, she just became a nun. Did nothing significant in her life for us. But for God she did, and John Paul II, canonized her in the year 2000. Also things that keep other people from believing God's existence are scandals. And especially in the United States when you say a scandal, yes, we are part of it. No one is free from sin. No one is free from temptation read the biographies autobiographies stories of souls of the saints they will tell you they will tell you about temptation the greatest temptation especially those who are going through the best the highest spiritual experiences that there are I was just listening in the car um, Teresa of Avila the story of soul how she was describing and then she was not very educated but when you read it I mean, you cannot help it but say I mean who wrote it God himself through her the temptation the confusion that enters a soul during a prayer and they know someone asked me if a, a saint can be condemned well isn't it saying in the gospel that those who were given more from those who were giving much much will be expected yes or no that's what it says I don't know if it actually it is connected with the Saints but it seems like it can be they are given special graces because remember that faith is a gift from God if it not a gift you would not be here if he had, if he had not given it to you you would have not been here that's the thing, that's a gift. Everything is a gift. Well, I think we'll talk about it later. 
Not today, though. So, after all, people can express about themselves that they are religious beings. And I like what I've heard in the United States, coming from a Catholic country, where everyone who I knew ever was a Catholic. I've heard from someone that um, one of you, college friends, I think that um, in Georgia, wherever you go, whoever you talk to, young people, they always ask you what church you go to. Well, that's a good thing, okay, even if it's not a Catholic church. That means that people actually care for God. Go to Europe. I will not name the countries, not Poland though. <laughs> no one will ask you about God. They just don't talk about God. They don't want to talk about God. Why would they? We have prosperity, things, pleasures, money. Huh, come on. I guess I will have to skip some things, huh? Oh, I think that's also in important what it says here about those who actually feel that there is God, that God exists and created all things, but resist to acknowledge God because they just don't want to obey. And that's a thing that can happen to everyone, yes. It is difficult to obey other people, especially beings who you cannot see. And there is, you know, the law is written, given thousands of years ago to a man who was wearing sandals and was dirty and was sh shepherding the sheep and then was growing a beard and there was asked by God through a burning bush to go to Egypt and free the people and who wants to believe that? When we are all clean, shaved, intelligent, living in palaces, not wearing sandals too often, we don't want to serve God sometimes. So the book calls us the generation of seekers and I like that very much. Why is that? Because the more we possess material things, the less we are satisfied. That's why. That's why we are a generation of seekers. That's why we are probably the biggest number right now is the big, probably, maybe, it's just my thought, but because of all of the material wealth that we possess as human beings accumulated throughout the world, we are the least satisfied generation ever. Probably. Probably. Because we live surrounded, bombed by material things and pleasure that not necessary sometimes come from God. And it really builds a wall between our souls, the spiritual parts of our person, and God Himself. So, the more we suffer, the more we look for answers. And spiritual suffering cannot be healed by all of the pills that exist or are in possession of every single CVS or Walgreens throughout the world. They just cannot. Wounds cannot be healed in that way. They can be healed sometimes by a priest in the sacrament of confession. And I can tell you already that some people who have gone everywhere else, including psychologists, psychiatrists, um, visionaries, ultimately sometimes, even though they are not believers, they will end up in a priestly office because there is nothing else to do. There is only someone who is connected to God by the priestly office and ordination who can actually 
offer something more. This world will never make a pill that will satisfy spiritual longings ever. This is it. What everyone longs for is salvation, love, justice, and mercy. Every single person, every single act that we do, every single action is directed by love and goodness. People are confused these days. We are confused. And the murderer who kills someone, he thinks it's good to kill. We never act against goodness. We may have a um, the form image of goodness but we'll always follow this goodness human beings don't act against goodness even if we steal we think it's good to steal in that situation you know it was just okay I needed it this person didn't need it we can explain it to ourselves okay discussion in the book uh, we may not have the time I don't know what's going on here <laughs> Um, well, I guess I will leave you some time at the end for questions, yes. Um, hmm? Yeah, I, I think, well, well, there are some what you're looking for in life. Well, these are just, I, I hope you all have read it, yes? And now you will be answering maybe according to something that I've said. Um, the for discussion section is something that you should actually discuss with your spouse, friends, or just talk to yourself, think, and go through it. Meditation is perfect. St. Augustine and his confessions is just something that um, everyone should maybe even memorize. So, let's move to the second chapter. After I have a drink. Please stay with me. If you need a coffee, I understand. You may be falling asleep. It's been a long day and I am not helping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so God reveals His holy name. That's the title of the chapter. I love it. Because I don't know why, but I just feel something in my heart when I, every time I read this this passage from the book of, of Genesis, I hope it is the book of Genesis, I believe it is the book of Genesis or Exodus maybe, um, when, when God introduces himself and says, I am who am, it's not my favorite translation. In Polish, <laughs> it is jestem, który jestem. I know, it sounds so cool. <laughs> Yes, them, Kturi, yes, them. It indicates it just it's, it's very explicitly someone who never had never begin began to exist and will never end, and there was never time that he was not, and there will be never time that he will be not. It's just can you even grasp it when you start thinking about? The past that never actually ends. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> so God reveals his name to the creatures. And um, I went to Mexico once uh, a few years ago to study Spanish. <laughs> Failure. Um, and, <laughs> and I went to Teotihuacan where they have those pyramids built by the um, Aztecs, I believe, or my Aztecs, Aztecs. And they had this pyramid of the sun and pyramid of the moon where they were sacrificing people. And that sets, says something about our God, about His mercy and love for us. Because look how silly it was. They were killing people believing that they would please gods. Yes, they would do everything for their gods. They would kill children, they would kill adults, they would go long distances to find people 
and they would bring them back, risking their lives just in order to cut their head off and throw it down so it could jump on the steps and go down and they would have a big siesta because their God was pleased. And what did God do? The real God, the only God. God our Father. Okay, in His love and mercy, He spoke to men. Why did He do that? Because He wanted them to actually know how to worship Him. Not to be confused anymore. To love Him because He is all loving and does not desire sacrifice. He says that in the Gospels, not in the Gospels, in the Gospels He repeats. I do not desire a sacrifice, but your love, okay? So keep your bulls and pigs and pigeons and all the other f birds, eat them, don't kill them for me. It's enough, it's been enough. You need to be elevated with your spiritual life. You are in charge of this world, and I, God, who am, will give you dominion again. So God invites people to Himself. And I actually, when I was reading it, and Father MacDonald said, don't read it, you will not remember anyway. <laughs> I don't, that's why I have the book here. I don't have to remember everything. God said, come, close, I am here, and I am holy. How do we know that? Because he says, take off your sandals, I am speaking to you. This is not another person, you will act in a different way from now on. I am calling you to change your behavior, because I am your God. And we are talking about the Old Testament right now. Where people were not used to loving their enemies. It was just the basic morality that God expected from them. But then as we were study or you studied the history of the Israel, God would expect more and more from them. He would elevate his expectations. And they would fail. They would fail miserably. Again and again and again. Until Jesus Christ came. And the leaders failed again. I am the God of your father. Introduction. And you know how it is with names. I am horrible with names, but I would never forget the name of God who would speak to me from a burning bush, I hope. But that's how he does. You recognize the name, you know something about this person. In our times, children received all kinds of names that I don't understand, obviously. Um, mean sometimes something, uh, I guess. But in the past, a name was given to a person and it had a meaning, okay? When we go back to Hebrew language, Names mean something. My name, sorry, selfish and proud, but I know what my name means. So I'll tell you, my name means David, the beloved one. It has a meaning, yes? Therefore, God introducing himself says something about himself. And Moses knows that he was born some years ago and one day he will die like everyone else, but not this God. And also, he says to Moses, don't be afraid, because I will be with you. Stop thinking about the things that you cannot do, because I will be with you all the time. I have a little note here, because I would like to say something later. <laughs> So now, later on, God reveals His loving plan to save us. Through whom? Jesus Christ. 
Man cannot possibly arrive at, by his own power, the order of divine revelation. But there is another order of knowledge, and that's the order of divine revelation. We all can arrive to a certain degree of knowledge, yes? Some of you, a lot of knowledge there. But, not divine revelation. Not about God, unless God decides in His love and mercy always to speak to us. Otherwise, we would have been probably sacrificing our own children to God or doing or other crazy things. I don't know. But these people were serious about their gods because they just didn't know. But look how they were looking for answers. How they were the generations of those who were searching also. And most of them, most of the people that we know, I think, at least as I know, were people who believed in deities. Most of them. Wasn't it more easy for them to believe in a deity because they lived in a simple world? That was a natural world? I guess, maybe. It is more difficult for us for sure. We know that. So, even if people had spent centuries and hours, countless hours, centuries on studying and thinking about God, they would have had no answers unless God decided to say something about Himself. Come out and say, okay, look at me. So what was the best way He could do it? According to God Himself, we believe that He chose the best way to do it. Could have God chose a different, chosen a different way of introducing Himself to us and saving us than sending His only Son, Jesus Christ, to be killed? Could He do it in a different way? Of course, because He is God Almighty, yes? When we think about Jesus' passion, we may say, why so much? Why are you so cruel? Why so much passion? Why so much suffering there? Could one drop of Jesus' blood have redeemed the whole human race? Yes. Of course. Even one scratch. But that was not God's plan. And we may say again, you see, you Catholics, you believe that this God he is mercy and love and would what He did to His own Son. Well, there was a reason. And the reason was love. God wanted to show how much He can endure for us, out of love for us, that we can do horrible things to His Son and He will still save us. So the one who is God Himself will make His ways known to us in the most clear way for human beings by introducing His only Son in the form of a child, of a human being. So He comes as a baby so we can actually bow to Him because He is small. We can embrace Him because He is cute. We can hold the baby because it's appealing, it's a baby. So it was smart, pretty smart. Now, this Son, Jesus Christ, what does He really reveal about the Father? As I was reading that thing in simple ways, so I was thinking, uh, well, any fathers and sons here? No? When you look at yourself, do you look, yes or no? No fathers and sons? Okay. Well, do you all look like your father? A little bit? Walk like your father sometimes? Talk like your father? Have eyes like your father? Feed like your father? Something like your father? Let's hope. Well, the same with Jesus Christ. Okay, He is the walking image of His Father. We are all created in the image and likeness of God, aren't we? We are. 
So in a simple human way, Jesus Christ was created in the image and likeness of his Father, of God himself. That the person of Jesus Christ is human being. But he reveals through his actions, through what he says and how he says it and how he treats other people, he reveals who his Father is, yes? Because he acts the same way as his Father would. The same way. That's how we learn about God the Father. Every single thing that Jesus did was in agreement with his Father. He didn't want to do anything else than what the Father wanted to do and accomplish here. That was the only goal of his existence here, of being here, to do the will of the Father. He repeats that all the time. When he is suffering in the garden, he says, take, if possible, take this chalice away from me. But it didn't happen because the Father. So the Son listens in a perfect way, the most perfect way, and giving an all example of how we're supposed to be act acting. Now, what is expected from us? How can we, what can we do if, if God Himself introduces Himself to us? What can we do? What should we do to respond? Should we even respond? What is going on in our mind? How would we know? Well, He tells us. First of all, we have to believe that this is God. Yes, the gift of faith. That's the initial step. There is nothing else. I mean, if you don't believe that this is God, you will not respond in the way you should. But God did say what He wanted. He came and said, I mean, I expect you to do this. You will go, He says to Moses, He says to Abraham, He gives them specific tasks. And through Jesus Christ, He gives us specific tasks. That's how we answer Him, through our life. Not with sacrifice, bloody sacrifices, but with sacrifices of our life. That we say no to some things that we do some things. That's what happened there. God makes faith possible. And now, another here, a thing here. Sometimes um, when God introduces Himself to us and He is so loving and, and all-knowing and we know that, we recognize His goodness. That's the thing, okay? When we are introduced to God, when we actually get to know Him a little bit, we recognize that there is something so good about Him that we don't feel worthy to be in His presence. That's what it says here in your textbook. Um, that some of the saints, uh, some of the prophets, and also St. Peter, and that was the cause, maybe that's why he was chosen, when they get to know God a little bit more, they say, they recognize their own sinfulness and they don't want to be close to Him. Because, why? Why do we have a problem with following God's commandments? Why do we have a problem with becoming friends with God? Because it's a difficult thing to do. Because it requires, it requires a change in our life. You all have friends, yes? We all have bef best friends, I guess. And in order to have a best friend, you have to have something in common. In order for this friendship to survive, we have to have something in common. Otherwise, we'll, have na we'll not have any common topics to discuss. We will be bored with our own presence. We will feel disconnection. When I, w when I enter the seminary, um, some of my friends stopped talking to me. I came back to Poland or whatever after a few years um, and I met some of my friends and we didn't have any common topics anymore because they stayed where I was before I entered the seminary and I was somewhere else now. I wanted to talk about different things and we just, have, we just had to part our ways. There was no other choice. And God gave me other friends who actually have things in common and it's beneficial for me and I hope for them too. And the same with God here. 
if we don't have common things with God, meaning goodness, love, forgiveness, all these things, then how can we be His friends? We cannot say, I am a friend of God, if I don't even try to be like Him, or have things in try to act like He would act. That's what is going on here. That's why in the beginning of our journey with God, that's why in the beginning of our journey with God, we acknowledge that we are different than Him. That's what happened here in the Gospel with St. Peter, for example, in, with Isaiah. In the beginning of our journey with God, we acknowledge that we are different. And we say what? Depart from me because I am unworthy of your friendship. Yes? That's what we should do. Because we are not like God. Nuh uh Not in the beginning at least. We are far, very different. And the initial step usually to conversion after we convert and we become Catholics is to go to confession. Because it makes us a little bit more like Him. It gives us the grace to become like Him. So that's the simple way, I guess, of explaining friendship and that's why Peter, he is the model for us, I guess. I just discovered this last Sunday, actually. I preached about it. I don't know what's going on. But I discovered this last Sunday. That his example is the example I want to follow every day. Because Jesus is walking and picking his disciples on the shore of the um, Lake of Galilee. And he says, hey, you fishermen, you will go after me. And what did Peter do? The perfect response to God himself. He gets down on his knees and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I cannot walk with you because we are so different. And Jesus says, You will go with me. And this friendship will change you. And you will become... Christ-like. Didn't say that, because he was Christ. <laughs> but he said, you will become like me. He didn't say that really, but he thought that maybe, okay? <laughs> but I think it makes sense, a little bit, at least for me, that in order to be friends with God, we have to acknowledge first that we are completely different. And that he is something special and we are not and we want to learn i want my best friend to be the best he can be or don't do this and or don't do, do that don't sin all this friend is demanding yes but he leads us to salvation to the best life that there is and that's the truth that's the simple truth so i have a best friend not God, I mean God, I hope, but one of the friends who, um, well, I had a, a bunch of friends, then they left, they didn't want to hang out with me anymore because I was, you know, oh, he's so holy, or whatever. <laughs> um, but this one stayed with me, and now his life is changing also because we are best friends since our high school, and I'm not saying he wants to be like me, he's married, I mean... Um, <laughs> um, but he was here at my first uh, mass, my ordination. I was his best man for his wedding. Um, so, but he asked questions. He knows that I changed the, by the grace of God. That it's no longer the same David who was with him when we were in high school. Yes, and it was a great sacrifice because all other friends that I like don't like me anymore. But him is a biblical friend. God rewards our sacrifice. He gives us something else. He will not leave you alone if you sacrifice for him. He will replace it with something better. That's how he is. Goodness. So he did. I have a friend. I can count on him. And he wants to be a believer. He wants to follow the faith more. He asks questions. Praise God for him. So the initial thing is to acknowledge who we really are. Sinful creatures in constant need of God. I always say that. I like it. 
I guess um, the revelation continues through the gospel and culture. And it is an interesting quote from, I don't have my glasses, from um, Paul, Paul VI, the one who actually carried a huge cross because of his Evangelium Vitae encyclical. Like this guy was really, I mean, this Pope was really crucified for that. So he knew what suffering was. He understand, he understood that fitting into the frame of culture for religion is an extreme. Back then in the 60s, okay, he wrote something that was not received well even here in the United States, but some of the bishops or priests. The Evangelium Vita, he knew he was a visionary, a prophet. And he said, that the split between the gospel and culture is without a doubt the drama of our time. Um, some time ago I was reading an, an article sent to me by my um, pastor, Father MacDonald, of course, because he knows all things. So he sent me this email and with an article about Ireland and he said well this is what's gonna happen to your country Poland well that wasn't very nice <laughs> because as we know the church in Ireland is suffering it went down and there are no vocations you know the country that used to send missionaries to the whole world has but one seminary with a few seminarians zero in 20 years from one of the most Catholic countries in history went down to secularism complete. Why? I think it has to do with their culture. I don't know and I can just say some theories but they became a part of European Union. Um, people got wealthier, more wealthy, however you say it. and. God was pushed aside gradually and the culture developed, the culture started changing, it became more materialistic, looking into the future, modern, looking for scientific explanation, technological things and all that and very progressive, looking out of the country, not caring for the culture that they had the Catholic culture, looking into something different. That's what it is. That's in our time very present, okay? Let's change everything we have and let's find something that is different because it's exciting. Let's just do it. It's not going to cost anything. And we are actually, in fact, cutting off our roots. That's what's happening in Europe right now. I think, I fear for my country, Poland, because that's what's been happening. People are leaving Poland, for example, and going to different countries because of better job opportunities. But the result is divorce rate skyrocketing because they leave their families in Poland, go and work somewhere else, bring a lot of money home, build a home, buy a car. But the relationship between husband and wife disappears. How much will we pay for comfort? for things. Sometimes we pay with things we cannot pay for. The most important things. So we have split between religion and culture. Developing split it seems, at least in Europe right now. I don't know, I feel like this country may be a hope for Europe and one day instead of me coming to this country as a missionary because that's how I came, Savannah is a missionary diocese I may be sent back to evangelize my old country one day, God forbid, but you never know. Because religion doesn't fit in the framework of culture in Europe anymore. And John and Paul VI said that in the 60s. He saw it happening. It happens also because of misunderstanding of human anthropology. Anthropology without God. 
explaining human beings and existence and everything about God, the mystery of human person actually, excluding God from the picture. It causes confusion because it can be very appealing. Culture of disbelief. What is the cause of that? Materialism also? One sentence here that it's, I guess it's, it's prophetic, it's something that um, I think we've all have thought about. That we are called to new evangelization in, in, in the third, um, what is it, um, this century, yes? Okay, the millennium, the third millennium, there you go, thank you. <laughs> the third millennium, we are called for new evangelization, that we are supposed to be those going out uh, re and evangelizing the world. But really it has to start from within. We have to re-evangelize our own church, ourselves. We have to go back. We have to catechize, re-catechize ourselves. Because we know that there have been some damage done in the past that needs to be now corrected. And it's going to take at least another generation to do that. Generation of hard-working people for God. And that's one of the signs of new evangelization. I can tell you that uh, my friends, classmates from the seminary, um, they changed my life actually because I saw the, the zeal for God, for souls in them, in my classmates. It's a new breath. Seminarians are younger and younger, and it used to be 20 years ago, 10 years ago when I was coming. I'm the youngest priest right now in the Diocese of Savannah, but 10 years ago, I would have been, oh, I was called a baby priest in the bulletin, but I would have been called a baby priest anyway, because the average age of priests here was like 45, 50 years old. Now, it's gone down to 27, something like that. In a seminary in Mount St. Mary's, is it 27? That's very young for priests. So re-evangelization, and they know that, they know, so there is hope. I guess, you see, I'm not really prepared. So I guess um, with that, I can close and ask for God's mercy on me. And if you have any questions, don't ask them. <laughs> Wait for the others to answer next week. <laughs> um, what time is it? <laughs> it's time to fi Oh, it's 8.20. Okay, you have one minute. Any questions? No, thank you. It's been a um, great time with you. So I just want to ask, did you learn something new? Yeah, you did a great job. <laughs> right, so any questions? <laughs> yes? I don't speak English. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pros. Hmm? What? Oh, did I say that? Yeah. When? Talking about the Aztecs, they had a lot of deities. Oh, 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 gods. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a, that's a s uh, different way of saying, wow, I didn't know I know new more words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, deity is, is just a, I guess, not just a, but it's a different name for gods. Gods by, with the little, small g. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? Would you like me to clarify something? I, I must have been clear because otherwise I would have not understood it myself. Come on. <laughs> Can we conclude? You want to discuss with yourself, yes? I mean with, with your friends. <laughs> yes. That's it? Okay. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much.